morning, Crossroads family. It's so good to see you again this morning. And we hope for the last time that we have to come into your homes. For most of you, I know some of you may for the, for the next few weeks choose to, to continue to join us online. But we hope and pray that you are able to be with us next Sunday as we venture into coming together once again in God's house and the sanctuary together. And we are so looking forward to seeing you. Uh, we know that it's going to be different. But God is still God, and we're going to come together, and we're going to smile, and we're going to worship together. And more than anything, he said, where two or three are gathered in my midst, there I will be. It matters not how we convene, how we do, whether we can touch, shake hands, hug necks, or whatever. We're together in his presence, and that's what matters the most. Amen. So this morning, I hope that you are encouraged. I hope that you are excited. I hope that things are going well for you, and we look forward to seeing you together next week. Lord, we come before you. We thank you. We praise you, God, once again for allowing us, God, to have the breath and the life to get up this morning to come to worship you. We thank you, God, for the freedoms that we have, God. Oftentimes we take those for granted, God, but I pray, Lord, that you would remind us, Lord, each and every day of how privileged that we are as a people, as your people, God, to be able to come into your house, wherever that may be, God. We can establish your house. You are everywhere, God. And I pray, Lord, that we would always be mindful of that, that we can establish your house wherever we are. And God, I pray, Lord, this morning, God, that you would just minister to those that are in their homes, Lord. Maybe those are having to work this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that you would just be wherever they are, God. I pray that they would sense your hand upon them, that your fresh anointing, God, would just fall over them, God, and encourage them, Lord. And God, we pray that everything that is said and done in your house and in this service today, God, that you would receive the glory and the honor. Yes. God, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Yes.
you go before us. You go behind us, beside us, and within us. Your word says that you never leave us nor forsake us. Even in the deepest valleys, God, you're there. Lord, when we reach the peak of that mountain, you're there. The journey that we take, you hold our hand. Lord, most of the time, you just carry us. We thank you, God, for your presence now and always. And God, we speak and declare your favor over every generation in our family. those that may have lost children that haven't found their way back yet. We declare that they're going to find you in the name of Jesus. They're running to you, Father. Wherever they may be right now. Stir their hearts, Father. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We so appreciate it. We are excited about our time together today, and we're especially look forward, looking forward to the time we get to spend together very, very soon. A lot of people have expressed to me over the last several weeks that although, although it's only been a few weeks, it feels like it's been a few months since we've been able to worship together. And I know it's uh, been a very challenging time for so many people. And, and please know that uh, Myself and my wife and uh, our pastoral staff and our leadership praying earnestly, diligently for you every day. Uh, we know that that uh, nerves are uh, on edge in many in many cases, and we uh, we we know where our help comes from. And uh, today is uh, an opportunity for us to just gather with you uh, through this uh, vehicle of uh, media and uh, to encourage you and share a word that will uh, inspire you. We pray. And, challenge you as well. Uh, you, just as by way of just a couple of announcements, and then we'll pray over the offering. We are continuing our study this week on the nature and character of God. And uh, this week's uh, study is on the holiness of God. And uh, that is a very challenging topic and a very deep topic. And so uh, we will dive in on uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You can tune in uh, through the same channel, Facebook Live, and, and we'll be during that study together. Just want to let you know that while we're here and uh, via Facebook, that other ministries in our church are active and involved and outdoors uh, serving our community. And so uh, 
that what the enemy intended for evil, God is using for good. And we've been able to serve thousands of meals and uh, to encourage families. And so thankful. Uh, it's because of your generosity and support, prayer support, that we're able to do that. And that means the world to us. And we know without you and without the Holy Spirit working in your lives and, and ours that none of this would be possible. And, uh, we are we're so thankful. And, uh, of course, we hope soon to be able to resume our study in the sanctuary on Wednesdays, but all in due time. And so... Uh, we want to just remind you to, to uh, check back on the Facebook page uh, often. And uh, because of updates as they come, as we, we're made aware of things, we want to share those. There's a lot of time between now and next Sunday, seven days. And so uh, we promise that when you enter this facility, it will be as clean, uh, if not cleaner than it has ever been, sanitized. There won't be a bug within 100 miles. And uh, we are, we're doing our due diligence to make certain that you can gather with us safely uh, and securely without any, any fear. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, week by week, you continue to, to prove that your provider is faithful uh, and you demonstrate his faithfulness by being faithful and generous yourself. And so we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And uh, again, these ministries that we're doing, we couldn't do it without your support. And so uh, as you're faithful, uh, we're encouraged and strengthened. And, and uh, we don't, we're not putting money back, back uh, to hoard and to hide. We're, we're using... Uh, money is not to gather or, or to keep or capture uh, and to put, on, put it on uh, display. You know, money is a tool of expression or a vehicle of expression. And we're using that money uh, to further the work of the gospel, not just in Albertville and our surrounding area, but also around the world. And uh, thank you for supporting our missionaries. And please continue praying for them. This is a difficult time for them as well. Many of them are under the same restrictions and some even more so than what we've dealt with. And uh, again, we want to say thank you for being so faithful. And I want to pray over your finances this morning as we prepare to share this message with you. I pray again it will be encouraging and uh, inspiring to you. Father God, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, grateful for your pledge of promise that to the generous soul, those who trust you in, with their finances, God, you will cause blessings to multiply in their lives. And God, we don't give to get, but we simply know that when we do so, this, this law of seed, time, and harvest according to Genesis 8, 22, is always in effect as long as the earth remains. And so, Father, as we sow into the kingdom of God, uh, not only are, are those needs, uh, that, those monies used to meet needs locally and around the world, but, Father, that also keeps the flow going in our lives. And, Father, we're able to be not just blessed, but able to, to be more generous to those that are around us. And so, uh, Father, thank you for so many faithful um, servants and uh, givers and Lord, Lord, your word says that you, that you delight in, in, a, in, a, in a happy giver and someone who takes delight in their giving. And so, Father, thank you that, Lord, we don't do it under obligation or in fear. We do it with joy in our hearts. And we are honored to be entrusted with so much. And it's our delight to give to you that your work may continue in the earth. Bless every family under the sound of my voice today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. You know, the last several weeks has, in many ways, opened our eyes to a battle that we already knew was going on. But it is very easy to get so caught up in the everyday ordinary of our lives that we forget to see what is unseen. In this time of a, a worldwide crisis, health crisis, you've heard the words pandemic. Some have used the words epidemic. You've heard terms maybe that you didn't even know how to spell or, or what they even meant. And, uh, and, 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 and we've, there's a cast of characters that have paraded across our television screens over the last several weeks. And many of them are complete and total strangers uh, three months ago, but now we're, we know them almost on a first name basis. And you can get so caught up in what, what you see and what you hear. And there, there are reports of, of, uh, of, of all types of things. Uh, that this was hatched in some laboratory someplace or whatever. And you can, if, if you're not really, really careful recognizing the true origin of this battle, you can personalize it and make people the object of your scorn and disdain. When, when in truth, what we're experiencing right now, my friend, my brother, my sister, is spiritual warfare. And this, this morning I'm gonna share a message with you entitled The Reality of Spiritual Warfare. And I would say that it stands to reason that, that 
those of us that have grown up in church, that we've known this all along. And that is true to a point, but like all other truths, what you don't maintain or retain and keep in the forefront, it just kind of gradually gets filed back and back and back. And before you know it, what you once knew and knew well, you just discard. And we, we don't want to be guilty of that. And so today, by the Holy Spirit's help, as you will listen and receive his word, I pray that you'll be encouraged and again challenged by these words. And uh, I, I think maybe for some, Maybe this will awaken you to the battle that maybe you were a, a, a conscientious objector to, or uh, you did not have you didn't have any desire to fight. But recognizing the source of this battle puts it squarely on our shoulders as the family of God, as the army of God, to do our part. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing in Ephesians chapter six, says this: Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up, verse 13, the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And most of the time, we stop right there. Verses 10 to 17. But the reality is that the reason those seven verses precede this one is to lead up to this. This is the climax, the crescendo of this passage. See, all of those things that we're encouraged and instructed to do find their reason right here. Verse 18. Pray in the spirit always with all kinds of prayer and supplication. To that end, be alert with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In other words, the equipment is for the battle and prayer, the prayer closet, is the battlefield. The fact is that the spiritual armor that we are commanded to take up in Ephesians chapter six serves only to protect the army of God from the front. There are no defense, defensive weapons. There are no defensive strategies. The reason is because we are supposed to take territory, not surrender it. And in a time like we're living in right now, it's very easy to, 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 to hold up with your, you and your four no more and to, uh, it, like you're just trying to hold the fort and not trying to give anything up and not trying to lose this, that, and the other. My friend, as, as, as a blood-washed believer in Jesus, as a part of the army of God, our objective and assignment is not to retreat, it's to go forward. And we have to remind ourselves every day that this battle, though it caught many of us off guard, nobody expected this, but though it caught us off guard, it was not any surprise at all to heaven. God knew what was coming our way, and he's, that's the reason why we are adjured in Scripture. We're, we're, we're to stay in God's Word. We're to stay on our knees. Why? Because the battle may take different forms. There's been a battle going on long before this thing came along. And I remember in the early days of my faith, spiritual warfare was a very... A uh, vibrant topic and a very well-worn topic. And uh, it seems if, if, if my pastor wasn't teaching on it, my Sunday school class was, or the, uh, the Wednesday night study was about it. And so it's like, it, it, you know, from the, from the very beginning, I was 27 years of age, and, and I was, and before I even knew what I'd gotten myself into, I was fitted for a, a, an app for, for a fatigues. I was, I was fitted for a uniform in the Army of God. And you know what? That time was so powerful to me because I realized almost immediately, you know, salvation can be all about us. Lord, help me, me and my four no more. But I realized almost instantly that there was something in, that I was entrusted with, that God was empowering me and encouraging me and charging me as his son, as his representative in the earth to do my part in this battle. 
When my precious grandfather, my mom's dad was alive, we called him Gramps, but he used to say this, that he wanted us to do something that was hard. I don't know where he got this, but it became a well-worn phrase, and I've heard it used in many, many cases since then. He used to say it like this way, this ain't no picnic. He used to say that when he'd hand you a couple of buckets and told you to go out to the garden and pick beans. And then when you got back onto the, on the patio, he'd say, now shell them. And so, of course, you know, your, your fingertips were purple and they were sore for three weeks. But anyway, this ain't no picnic. I think sometimes, if we're not very careful, that we can present the church as an entertainment center. Come and get all your needs met. Come and feel good. And we'll serve you and we'll do this, that, and the other. And yes, servanthood is critical. But the purpose of, of inviting people into the kingdom is not so they can sit and soak and siesta. The purpose of being recruited as uh, and enlisted in God's army is for militant action. See, the truth is, even before we were born, we were in a war zone. And if you don't know it or haven't known it before, you need to know it right now. Our adversary challenges every move of God. Nothing happens in your life, positive or mine, that is not first challenged by our adversary. And nothing about our lives on earth goes uncontested unless we play into our enemy's hands. Ignorance and apathy are key assets in Satan's spiritual arsenal. They represent the greatest threats, in my opinion, to our survival and success as believers. I've been praying this for nine weeks, almost ten weeks now. God, wake up the sleeping giant. Rouse your army to war. And again, our, our, our warfare is not with flesh and blood. We're not fighting physical, visible foes. This thing goes way beyond that. But to show you about this warfare, even before we were born, there's a powerful passage of scripture in Revelation chapter 12 that talks about Israel, talks about Messiah. It said, read this, the first Six verses, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child and cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven, seven diadems on his head. He says, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. She gave birth to a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they might nourish her there for 1,260 days. Obviously, this is a prophetic scripture. But it speaks to us of Jesus' birth. And if you go back in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you, and John, you will see uh, these, these uh, symbolisms realized and played out in real time. The truth was Jesus was born into conflict. He was baptized in the Jordan River and enjoyed his father's favor. He was led by the Holy Spirit into battle. Notice that. When Jesus, after, he, after the, basically his coronation, the heavens opened and, and the voice was heard, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. From that point forward, Jesus' life was nothing but conflict. He was tempted in all points, just like all of us are. He faced every challenge with the word of God. He suffered abandonment and betrayal by those whom he trusted and loved. The most. He forgave his accusers, his haters, and his followers' failures. Whether you realize or not, that is a critical and oftentimes a make or break point in spiritual warfare. And lastly, Jesus is our model, our pattern, and our prophecy. When you think about what Jesus did for us, 
When you think about the reality that he said, follow me, we see, we want to follow him to church. We want to follow him to pick strawberries or to play softball or to go to the lake. But we don't want to follow him in his footsteps, his, the same path and pattern that he demonstrated. But as a child of God, that's our call. It's heartbreaking to see so many people sit in churches all over the world and not recognize that this is not optional. We win or lose on this point. See, to be engaged is to win. As long as you're moving forward, as long as you're in the battle, you will win. I like to say it this way. Wake up and smell the gunpowder. One of my favorite history uh, figures in history was Winston Churchill. I have three books of, of, about him and I have read those books. Uh, I think I still have them. I may have given them away, but his quotes were so profound. What an incredible uh, wit and wisdom he possessed. And in the heat of battle in World War II, his order to Lord Mountbatten was this. You are to plan for the offensive. In your headquarters, you will never think defensively. And this is how I personalize that. In my headquarters, in my mindset, I am never to think defensively. See, if, if enemy can use fear and panic and paranoia, and he's a great peddler of all those things. If he can get you on your heels, if he, can, if he can just cause you just for a moment to stumble, he can take advantage of you and go on the offensive. See, the reason why that your path and mine is not easy, it really is hidden for, for us in, a, in an Old Testament scripture in the book of Judges. You remember when God called the Israelites, the Israelites to go to the promised land and inherit the promised land and the land flowing with milk and honey and all those marvelous figures of speech and uh, word pictures that they, 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 they saw this paradise. But even though the land was theirs by right and assignment, notice this, Judges chapter 3, verse 2. Now these are the nations, watch this now, these are the nations that the Lord left to test those in Israel who had not experienced war in Canaan. So that later generations of the children of Israel who did not know war before might know it to teach them how to fight. Mom, Dad, do you know why you're in, engaged in spiritual warfare? It's not just your battle. It's not just your warfare. It's not just your challenge. Your children and their children and their children are watching you. They're watching how you fight the good fight of faith. They're watching you instead of uh, cowering and, and hiding and seeking refuge, instead of doing all that. No, you take those challenges face forward. You, you, you don't back down a, a, an inch because you recognize that you have to fight the good fight of faith and you need to teach your children who need to teach their children who need to teach their children. This song that the worship team sang just a few moments ago. May your favor be upon us to a thousand generations, to our family and their children and their children and their children. See, the generational, the covenant of blessings of God involved this warfare. And no generation comes along where everything was done for them by their, by, by their parents or grandparents, and they, and they just, all they do is eat cherries and watch the sun go up and down. No. From the moment you say yes to Jesus, you are fitted for the battle. You are, you are charged to take up your sword and to fight that fight. Know your enemy because he surely knows you. This is what the Apostle Peter wrote. He said, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, I want you to see that term there, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. My friend, whether you want to, Pastor, I don't want to think about those images. I don't want to think about being chased. And I don't want to, want to think about my adversary. It's not my decision. It's not my word. It's God's word. 
is God's word to us today. Be sober. In other words, be aware and awake. Be vigilant means to be watchful. It means not, it means not to slumber. Not, it means not to sleep on duty. It means to be watchful. And the reason is because we're always, the, at the moment we, we drop our armor, put our sword down, and begin to lie the gag, as my dad used to call it, we are fair game. And I'm not, I'm not trying to frighten you. I, I simply want you to understand this is what we're dealing with now. See, for many of us, we, we have no concept of spiritual warfare. This is foreign to us. I mean, when's the last time a church sent out a brochure to a community to invite them to their church and said, come and, 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 and we'll, sh we'll teach you how to fight? No, we don't use that terminology because it's too scary. But the truth is, that's the calling for every saint. And here's another truth. You're only as strong as your weakest link. See, this thing, the reason why you have to personalize it and the reason why you have to pass it along is because you don't want anybody in your family, your son, your daughter, their children, their children, etc. You don't want anybody in your family to let their guard down. You remember when, when the promise, when, when the children of Israel were entering the promised land and, and capturing and taking cities, there was a man named Achan. In Joshua chapter 7, is a tragic reminder that God's directives are non-negotiable if we intend to fight and win the good fight of faith. So why does that matter? See, at every point, at every point of obedience, when God asks us to do something or commands us to do something, we don't negotiate. We don't barter with Him. We don't say, "Well, can I, can I, can, can, we, can we negotiate the terms?" No, there's no negotiation. There's simply obedience or disobedience. See, victory is costly. But it's worth it. In Isaiah 59, verse 60, uh, 15 to 16, it says, Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. And my friend, this is exactly where we see right, where we are right now in this generation. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. If you want to be lampooned, laughed at, criticized, all you have to do is stand for truth. That's all you have to do. Then the Lord saw it, and it, it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness sustained him. What is that about? Simply this, we win or lose in the prayer closet. You can't fake it until you make it. See, your game or mine, whatever, whatever we truly and honestly are in private shows in public when we don't pray when we don't fast when we don't intercede when we don't labor on our knees in prayer for, the, for our neighborhoods for our city for our county for our state for our nation for our world it shows the great Ian Bounds one of the greatest apostles of prayer in history said this he said hurried devotions make weak faith feeble convictions Questionable piety. To be little with God is to be little for God. I want to ask you this morning before I plow through the rest of this. How's your prayer life? More than that, how's your devotional life? Do you spend time with God? I don't mean that. Got to hurry, got to hurry, got to hurry. Five minutes, you know, well, I got to pray, got to read my word. You know what you're going to get out of that? Nothing. None of it, none of it. Not, not, not anything. Not anything of value. Because, see, a relationship that, that, is, that is true and genuine, you cultivate it. You set aside time so that you can not just be in God's Word, but be in God's presence so He can explain His Word. And in those moments, in His presence, see, you lose all track of time. I know this personally. A lot of saints do. You find that if you set a time limit, that you frustrate yourself. Instead of, so instead of saying, I only have so and so, you say, God, I'm all yours. And he begins to reveal things to you in the deepest depths of your soul that no human being on the planet knows or can take from you. Pain in this battle is inevitable, but it is worth it. James chapter 4 says, therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. Say it with me. Resist 
the devil, and he will flee from you. Again, we are fitted only for offensive maneuvers. There is nothing on the backside of the Ephesians 6 soldier. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. These instructions, like many in the New Testament, are so often ignored. And I promise you, I could not fulfill my responsibility as a pastor or as a believer if I did not let you know and remind you what the word commands of us. The first thing that he, James said was submit to God. See, you either go, he's either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. You don't have segments or part, uh, portions of your life where that God is Lord and other parts there. No, he's either Lord of all or not at all. And I know that's a hard thing for us because there are certain, there are certain components of our lives that we want to control for ourselves. Well, God, I'll give you an hour and a half on Sunday if you'll give me this. Only to hear the Holy Spirit say in your prayer closet, no. No, I, I don't want 30 minutes. I want 24 hours today. And then tomorrow when you meet him again, he says, I want these 24. The next day, I want these 24. See, it's all or nothing. And this is not so that it, that to, to rob you of pleasures and joys in, 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 uh, in our customary, ordinary life. It's simply to make us aware that we have an assignment that assignment never takes a day off. The great D.A. Carson said this. He said, people do not drift toward holiness. We slough toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. I hate to say this, but it's the honest to God truth. This captures in many ways, the spirit of this age, the spirit, the spirit of the church age that we're in. The reason is because we are rarely challenged. We want to feel, we want, we want people to, be, to feel comforted, to feel safe, and all of those things. But the last time I checked, and I've got several friends that are, that are milit either in the military or have been in the military, and they assured me that the last thing they're drill sergeant cared about was their was their comfort and the last thing that the arm the, the the branch of military service they were involved with cared about was their future plans they had an objective they had a target they had a goal and every day those people woke up they knew what they were they were called to do and these these this these areas right here holiness i'm sharing on wednesday night about the holiness of god and if you, you want people's eyes to glaze over in church, start talking about holiness because it just it either sounds impossible or it's just not interesting. And yet the Bible says this in Hebrews, it says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So that's not an optional um, uh, characteristic or, or, or spirit, if you will. So I'm gonna encourage you today, if you intend to fulfill your responsibility as a soldier of Christ, if you intend to be a, a positive in this time of negativity, if you intend to be a person of hope and courage and confidence in this time of paranoia, you need to spend time with God. You need to recognize that he, listen, you were not born a year late or a year too early. You did not miss your season. No, you should not have been born a hundred years ago. God, has called you into the kingdom for such a time as this. You need to accept that and wear that, not in some arrogant fashion, but recognizing if God, if he, you could, he could have had you born any time in history. He chose your parents, he chose your place, and he chose your priorities. See, failure affects all who depend on us. Paul, writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, says this. He says, know this. In the last days, perilous times. Now, as I'm going to slow down. I want you to think through these things with me and tell me if this does not sound like a snapshot of our generation. 
Perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, slanderers, unrestrained, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And Paul finishes that statement by saying this, turn away from such people. Why would he say that? If, in, if, if your friendships depict these characteristics, if the people you, you choose to be with when you are at leisure fit any of these categories, my friend, you are in dire straits. You, you have put your spiritual walk with God in peril because these traits are not marks of spirituality. They're marks of anti-Christ. They are the exact opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Turn away from such people. One of the reasons is because when you're with people who fit any of those categories, you become blind and indifferent to your calling as a priest of God, as a king of God, and as a soldier of God. And when you fell on those three areas right there, your spiritual life will crumble, completely crumble. What you have spent years, what you and God have spent years and years and years building can be gone just like that. It's the power of association. I said it this way, good riddance. Anything that ties your heart to this world should be treated as a mortal enemy to be defeated and destroyed by the power of God. See, the truth is this, saint. We war here. We don't. We're not warring to win. We're warring from victory. You'll see that in a few minutes. But well, we must continue to fight our fight. We can't, we can't lay down our arms in this moment. And so anything that, that tends to blind us to that reality, that ultimate reality of spiritual warfare, and makes us cozy and comfortable in, our, in the here and now, that is not your friend. That's not from God. Some of the things that we praise God for giving us, if we step back for a second, start from a different perspective, we realize, no, ever since I began doing this, my heart began to go, grow cold toward God. Ever since I, I had this, I, I became indifferent to the things of God. See, when you were broke, busted, and disgusted, you were on your knees at the altar. Nobody had to call you to prayer. You did it because your survival depended upon it. And I'm not saying that God wants you desperate like that. I'm simply saying this. You need to maintain your edge. See, victory affects all who depend upon us. This passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy is a very convicting passage to me. And I pray it is to you. You may have never, have never seen this before. Deuteronomy 23, 14 says, For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you. Now, I would love to stop right there. But I'll leave in the whole Bible. Amen. So the first thing we find in this verse is that God is in our midst. Hallelujah. And he wants to give us victory. And the second part of this verse says this. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he does not see any indecent thing among you and turn away from you. I want you to think with me for a moment about what we let in our homes. What we let in our ears. What we let pass through the eye gate and then inflame our imagination. See, if God is with us to help us defeat our adversary, and all he asks of us is that we keep our camp, our hearts, our life holy, the reason is not to, to punish us or to penalize us. It's because he, we, we, we don't recognize. It's like Samson and Delilah. It's, it's like it's laying in... in in the lap of someone who is not interested in what, what, where you're going, she's in, she or it is interested in what they can get from you. So we, again, we're on active duty. Say it with me, active duty. You're not in the reserves. You're not in the reserves. You're not 
on vacation. You're in active warfare. And if you don't have that mentality, what, what happens is you, you, you begin to be anesthetized by the spirit of this age. When at once we were, I mean, we, we, were, we reported for, for duty and we were ready. We were prepared. We had all of our ducks in a row, so to speak. We were armed and dangerous. And nowadays, so many of us have become lax and indifferent. We no longer pray like we once prayed. We don't worship like we once worshiped. We don't fast like we once fasted. We don't give like we, like we once, gave, once gave. Why? Because the edge is off. Today I brought a book to show you. I know if you're a part of Crossroads, you've seen me talk about this book many times over the years. And you, It's dog-eared. It's yellowed. There are pages I literally have highlighted through to the other side. And I keep it on my desk. And every every home I've, that we've been, we've been uh, that we've had over the years, when I when I kept this at home, it was always by my bedside. And I have feasted on these pages of spiritual nourishment from the pen of Wesley Duell, mighty brethren prayer. He's a was a Methodist leader, and uh, he may still be alive. I hope he is. Written several books that challenged me, but I, I took this. This challenge from a chapter that he wrote about spiritual warfare in this book. And this is how it goes. Do you hate sin like God hates sin? Do you feel the scandal of God's name being dishonored and God's will hindered? Do you see humankind enslaved and abused by Satan and his followers? Do you burn with zeal for God's will and God's glory? Are you unwilling for spiritual detente and relaxation of tension with Satan? Wow. Let's negotiate. No, I mean, I don't want to be at war. Let's, no, you don't sit down at a table with, with your adversary and make a deal. No to spiritual detente. Are you unwilling for peace through spiritual coexistence? Don't be afraid of spiritual warfare, of prayer warfare. Don't fear the price of victory, Brother Newell says. Give yourself to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to instill his holy militants in you. Ask God to saturate you with his holy warrior spirit. Powerful. That is so powerful. Another favorite author, missionary to China for years, Arthur Matthews says, in any situation where Satan dominates and threatens, God looks for a man through whom he may declare war on the enemy. He purposes that through that man, Satan be served notice to back up, pack up, and clear out. In this generation and time we're living in, I still believe this very truth, that God is looking for a man, looking for a person through whom he may declare war on the enemy. Will you be that person? Are you that person? Finally, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Say it with me. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought captive into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. If it does not line up with God, if, if it does not forward His advance in this world, if it does not contribute to His kingdom cause, it's not for me. It's not for you. Ephesians 2 6. Is a powerful reminder, my friend. And he raised us up and seated us together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Stuart Holden could not have said it better. We go into battle not from the perspective of our circumstances here on earth, but from our position above in Christ. 
See, when you recognize that the battle is not here, but there. And though, though our bodies are here, obviously, our spirits are there. And we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a position of victory because the Bible says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That means as far as God's concerned, you've already ascended. You're with him. He's empowered you. He's anointed you. He's assigned you. This book that I was sharing with you a few moments ago, Mighty Prevailing Prayer. There's a chapter in this book on powerful answers by agreement in prayer. And I, I'm going to try to make it. The first time I read this, I cried like a six-year-old girl because this, this story is about six-year-old girls. Some people want to know, why, Crossroads, why are you so, why are all about kids? A child's prayer is so powerful. Pandita, this is about revival in India. Just bear with me because these names are weird. Pandita Ramabai, who died in 1922, was born in a very religious Hindu home. By the time she was 12 years old, she could recite 18,000 verses of the Hindu scriptures. She was wonderfully converted to Christ and set up a boarding school in 1899, later expanding it into a women's home. Her settlement at Ketyan near Pune, India, grew to a community of over 1,300 people. In 1901, God sent much blessing, and 1,200 people were converted and baptized in two months. In 1904, when God sent tremendous revival to Wales, a Welsh missionary to India wrote home, begging the people to pray that God would send revival to India. A large group of coal miners began to meet daily at the entrance of the mine for a half hour before dawn, before dawn, before dawn. Agreeing in prayer for revival in India. After some weeks in prayer, they received the message, revival has come to India. In the meantime, news of the revival in Wales reached Ramabai, and she started daily prayer meetings for revival in India. By June 1905, there were 550 meetings twice daily to agree in prayer for revival. 550 people praying twice daily for revival. One day, one of the girls was filled with the Holy Spirit and was so transformed that soon, girls all over the grounds were on their knees weeping and confessing their sins. The next evening, during the evening prayer, the Holy Spirit came in power upon the girls with the spirit of repentance and the spirit of intercession. Little children, teenage girls and young women were weeping and confessing. Two little girls prayed for hours for revival. One day, some of the girls asked a staff member what Luke 12, 49 meant when Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth. They determined to pray for this fire. As they agreed in prayer, revival deepened. The work went on, and the spirit of prayer and supplication for revival in India was poured out like a flood. Waves of prayer go over the meetings like the rolling thunder. Hundreds pray audibly together. 700 girls and women gave themselves to prayer. Each day about 60 went out by turns to help evangelize. One party of these girls came to a town where there was a missionary and asked him for permission to stay and pray for his work. They asked for a half, uh, for a hall or a shed, any place where they could pray. He gave them permission. That evening, an Indian pastor came to his door, began to weep and said that God had convicted him of sin and that he felt he had to come and confess his wrongdoing. After he received assurance of God's forgiveness, another Christian arrived under deep conviction of sin. Then followed a succession of one after another, people coming under deep conviction of sin. No meeting had been announced. It was the Holy Spirit working and answered a prayer of agreement of these children and girls. There was a remarkable time of blessing. Backsliders were restored, believers were sanctified, and healing brought into the fold. Last paragraph. 
One group of Ramabai's girls went to Northwest India to an area which is now part of Pakistan. They began immediately to have meetings of united prayer. One prayer meeting lasted six hours. A missionary lady looked out about midnight and was surprised to see a light burning in one of the girls' tents, which was contrary to rules. She went to correct the girl and found a girl of 15 years of age kneeling in the farthest corner with a small candle in her hand and a list of 500 girls' names in her other hand. She was interceding one by one, hour after hour before the Lord. Again, God poured out his blessing. What makes those stories so attractive and so powerful is the lack of those types of stories in our day. And maybe it's the convenience that we have. Maybe it's the entertainment options we have. My friend, my brother, my sister, if we don't recognize the reality of spiritual warfare, if we don't recognize that we are called and empowered to engage the adversary, instead of taking what he dishes out, instead of, instead of backing up and letting him have more and more and more ground, instead we square our chin and say, no, you're not taking another square inch in Jesus' name. I'm not backing down. I'm not retreating. I'm advancing in Jesus' name. And if I perish, I perish, but I will not perish running backwards. I hope and pray, my friend, that you love your family, love your neighborhood, love your city, love your county, love your state, love your nation, and love your world enough to say, whatever it costs me, I want God to do a work in my heart so I can do a work that will affect the earth around me. Today, 30,000 people in the Arab world will confess Christ. 30,000. And the majority of them have backgrounds where Christianity is forbidden under penalty of death. And they will risk their lives to confess the name of Jesus as Savior. What are you willing to pay? You want to fight to win? Or do you want to box in the air? Do you want to look the part? Or do you want to play the part? If you love your family like you say you do, and you care for your community like you say you do, I'm asking you as your brother in Christ, stand with me. Stand with me. I'm not retreating. I'm not backing down. I'm not giving ground. I'm not yielding my life, my family, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I'm not giving those generations which God has commanded the blessing on. I'm not giving safe access to them. I'm standing guard. I'm on my watch until Jesus calls me home. There's so much to be done. And God, the Holy Spirit, has empowered and entrusted you and me to do that. That warfare. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Fathers, we come into your presence again in prayer. We are reminded of the stakes. They're so high. If we fail in the prayer closet, if we fail to put on the full armor of God, if we fail to pray in the Spirit on all occasions, it's not just what we lose. It's what our heritage loses. It's what our church loses. It's what our community loses. Our county. Our state. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm asking you, Father God, to ignite a flame in the hearts of those who are here this morning. That they will recognize, God, this is not the time. This is not the time to sit on the sidelines. This is not the time to entertain offense. This is not the time to shirk their duties and say, no, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to do this. God, you're calling us to, into active duty, to be light in darkness, to push back the darkness in Jesus' name. To stand our ground for the sake of our community. God, I'm asking you for 700 girls and women. I'm asking you for 7,000 girls and women. I'm asking you for 70,000 girls and women. God, if 
if these types of moves of your spirit happen in India, surely they can happen in Alabama. Surely they can happen in Abbeville and beyond. God, we're yours. We're yours. Forgive us for our backslidings. Forgive us for our indifference. Forgive us for our being seduced by the adversary into seeking comfort and ease rather than a weapon and armor. Jesus, save my family. Come on, you can pray that with me right there where you are. Jesus, save my family. I don't want a single solitary soul to enter eternity without you. Confessing you on their lips as Savior and Lord. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, this week, I pray for encouragement. I pray for, I pray for nerves of steel. I pray for a backbone that leans into the fight, not runs from it. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding us of this spiritual warfare that is real, whether we recognize it or not. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, that this week will be available and on active duty in every situation we us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. We appreciate it so much. I promise you, I promise you that our pastoral staff and leaders are praying for you every single day. I have a list of names, and I don't check that list. I don't, I don't check a box or any, no. Those names, your names are on my heart every single day. And I carry you with me. And so many others do here, here do as well. And next Sunday, when we meet, I just want to assure you we're doing everything that we have been advised to, to make certain that you are safe, that you can enter and exit in a safe fashion without any fear at all. We're making certain that you are going to come in being celebrated and feeling, um, feeling loved. I can promise you that. And uh, be praying with us, would you? There are a lot of hurdles to jump. This is a weird time in our nation, in our world. And uh, we're, we're, we're thankful that we're here for such a time as this. And uh, agree with us in prayer that God is going to use uh, the opening, the reopenings of churches around us. Some are, are up and going. And uh, but we, we pray that God will use this time as a, a tool of revival for our community and beyond. Would you join me in prayer for that this week? Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Thank you.